and welcome. Final Monday um, of the semester, at least for the seminar series. I'm happy to introduce our colleagues Sarah Flood and Phyllis Mullen. Sarah uh, is a uh, 2009 PhD uh, in sociology. She's a director of US microdata projects at the Institute for Social Research and Data Innovation. Um, I think of her primarily as working on CPS and uh, Ithens Time Use. She has interest in work, family, and time, education, uh, life course, and labor, um, and of course, demographic data infrastructure. Her work has appeared um, in, in places like uh, journals of gerontology, journal of marriage and the family, uh, demography frequently. Her colleague, Phyllis Mullen, uh, also has a PhD in sociology. I don't remember the year, but it was a little bit before 2009. Um, she is McKnight Endowed Presidential Chair in Sociology and Director of the Life Course Center, which is now housed uh, also in the Institute for Social Research and Data Innovation. Her work is um, primarily on the intersection of work, time, and career retirement scripts in the context of 21st century uh, workforce and economic realities. And it has appeared in every major sociological and demographic journal in recent years, including in a number of books. Uh, and I would venture to say she's the most prolific <coughs> sociology faculty member that we have. But she, I don't know if she's ever had a mug. I've never had a mug. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Thank you. So this is a paper by um, Sarah Flood, Katie <coughs> Genetic, and myself. And I turn the wor words around so it says Sarah Flood and Phyllis Moen, and she turns it back, and she had it last. So. <laughs> Katie got left off because she's not physically here. But we're t one of the things that I emphasize a lot is that this is a, we're living in times of multi-layered, complex social change, and we focus on work and how how the economy is changing with new technologies and everything. But families are changing as well, and um, particularly with the increase in um, life expectancy, uh, couples can expect to be together a long, long long time <laughs> and both his and her marriages are changing and also what we think of as aging is changing the, uh, what I call the lockstep life course is changing and um, there uh, this is uh, sort of the new version of the li latest version of the life course in that uh, a lot of scholars including Jalen Mortimer and um, others are talking about um, Emerging adulthood. Jalen doesn't like that phrase, but what do you what do you call it, Jalen? Transition to adulthood or early adulthood. Early adulthood. But there's this this new gap, this new life stage where you're not uh, an adolescent, but you, neither are you a full fledged adult in terms of the uh, the roles that were traditionally taken on that Dennis Hogan talked about. And then even adulthood is very unconventional. Uh, with loosely coupled careers of husbands and wives, but also uh, uh, in, in um, the ordinal pattern of one's life. And there's what I call encore adulthood. It's uh, after the career and family building years, but before the frailties of old age. What we've postponed is the frailties of old age. And it's, both of these are more of a state of mind than an actual period of time. But um, what we're focusing on today is encore adulthood. Uh, the boomer cohort is right in the middle of these encore years, around 50 through 75. Um, and uh, they're making transitions in their lives at the same time that larger transitions are taking place in society. There's more heterogeneity in the nature, timing, and duration of retirement transitions, including unretirement. This is the first cohort where large numbers of husbands and wives are retiring at the same time, not necessarily at the same time, but confront two retirements, his and hers. Prior to that, married women were working, but they typically didn't have career jobs that they retired from. They just stopped working when uh, not thinking of themselves as retired, except in relation to their husband's retirement. 
this, they are living longer, healthier lives than previous cohorts, and they have longer time horizons. You plan differently when you don't expect to d die shortly after uh, turning 65 or leaving the workforce. You, you plan very differently, which is resulting in what's known as gray divorce. People are saying, do I really want to live with this person another 20, 30 years? And so, whereas before you might have hung in there, now you don't want to hang in so much. Uh, and then there's decisions about, well, what am I going to do with my life? These are some qualitative things. I, I, I did um, in-depth interviews. So the people talk about something to do. I need something to do. I need to get out of the house. And, and especially women talk about needing to get him out of the house. <laughs> that, um, I asked this one woman, what is her ideal retirement? And she says, my ideal retirement is to have my husband work 50, at least 50% time and not be in the house. So, <laughs> so this idea of togetherness that Sarah and I are going to talk about is really can be both positive and negative. We draw on a life course perspective, looking at the context and historical timing, and meaning that greater life expectancy means uh, couples are living together in this life stage that does, has no blueprints. We don't know how it is to not be old and, and uh, maybe not be, both of you be in full-time work. Uh, Leaked lives in the gendered life course. Uh, um, let me see what uh, Jesse Bernard said, that in every marriage is really two marriage, his and hers. And we really think that's true, that uh, um, talking to both members of a couple in qualitative research really shows that. Different experiences, different perceptions of relationships, and then adaptive strategies and agency. How do you spend time together? You could might be together uh, because you're sort of forced, thrown up, thrown into the relationship because of the absence of other roles in your life, but you can choose not to be in the same room, for instance. You can be together but be apart. Also, we take questions along the way. Is that right? Our research questions are, is togetherness simply what couples do in the absence of family or work responsibilities? In other words, they really feel they have no choice but to be together. I think all of us have seen these older couples at restaurants where they're both eating and not talking to one another. You know, I've, I've always resolved not to do that, and so I always had a, a, a lot of questions to ask so that I would never just be sitting there. Um, is being with one's partner in the encore years associated with experienced happiness or stress? And this isn't just general happiness or stress, and Sarah will talk about that. It's, it's your feelings at the moment. And does the quality of the relationship predict how couples do togetherness? What we know about working age people, we know a lot about marriage in, in the working age years. That one, it has been fundamental to the social organization of society. Marriage has, and whether it's still going to be that really is, um, it, it's changing. The nature of it is changing, especially in Europe. It's a source of support and protective factors promoting individual health and well-being, but that's only if the quality of the relationship is good. Marital strain uh, uh, accelerates health declines, higher marital quality is associated with greater life satisfaction. The individual well-being is enhanced for younger couples uh, when they're with a spouse. <coughs> Uh, and couples who spend time together have higher quality marriages. But those are people who are, you know, f under 50, under 55. So what we know about working age marriage is that shared time is associated with well-being and for working age adults. And individuals are happier and find more meaning and enjoyment and experience less stress when they're with their spouse. We also know that marital uh, support enhances life satisfaction, as I said, and uh, that marital quality and support promotes well-being. But what we're contributing is, one, we're examining this relationship for older adults, and we're combining assessments of marital quality with time-based diary measures of shared time, both active and passive. The active is when you're in the same room together, doing something together. Passive is when you're in the same vicinity, but he's in the garage 
or you don't know where he is. So, <laughs> d defining togetherness to what has been done thus far, uh, most research on time use in the past has been asking people, how many hours do you work? How many hours are you with your spouse? And, and people give global estimates, and all of us tend to overestimate the time we work, even though I claim that it's really true, um, the time that we think we're working. But what we have now is time diary-based measures. This is the idea of um, asking people yesterday, what did you do? Um, and how and were you doing those things alone together with children and different activities, etc. So now I'm turning it over to Sarah. Okay, so what we're talking about today is really um, two papers uh, focused on the same sort of phase of the life course using two different data sets. So the first one uses the American Time Use Survey. Uh, we're using data from 2003 to 2014. These data are available via IPUMS. Um, respondents to the American Time Use Survey reported their activities over one 24-hour period. So from 4 a.m. yesterday until 4 a.m. today, what were all of the activities you did? Um, one respondent per household completed a time diary. So we don't have couples um, per se, but we know a lot about who individuals live with. Um, and then I'll just mentioning here quickly, there's a well-being module in 2010, 12, and 13 that we're going to draw on for the second part of this analysis. Uh, so in the time diary, respondents report where they were, what they were doing, who they were with for every minute of the 24-hour period. Um, our measures are going to exclude sleep, personal care, and work because they're not consistently collected. Uh, or who information is not consistently collected. And what we're going to do is leverage the co-presence data, so who individuals were with during each activity, um, to examine total time with a spouse and time alone with a spouse. So our sample is uh, married individuals, and both of the members of the couple have to be between ages 50 and 79. And we have a pretty nice N, about 26,000. And so, like I mentioned briefly, our Two key outcomes are total time, so this is total number of minutes per day spent with a spouse, regardless of who else was there or what they were doing, um, and exclusive time, which is time alone with the spouse. A lot of the literature is really focused on time alone with the spouse, um, but we think, you know, maybe it's not about just being alone with that spouse, but it's okay to have other people there. Um, our measures are in minutes per day and we're going to use OLS models to um, look at relationships. <coughs> and so what we're expecting is that older couples will spend more time together than younger couples, right? As work demands decrease and we, children are launched, um, time demands change. And we also expect that paid work demands are going to um, constrain shared time. So here's a figure of um, married couples time together in the American Time Use Survey. And so what you can see is sort of um, in, this, in this half to the left here, um, this is sort of the family building, career building stage, and couples are averaging about 4.7 hours together per day. Um, this is weekends and weekdays combined, so that might seem like a lot on a weekday, but on a weekend there's quite a bit of time together and what you can see is that it increases with age and 65 to 69 year olds average about six and a half hours together per day. Yes? Sir, do you know if, uh, if um, the person is formally retired or working at all? Yeah, so we know whether they are employed um, and we don't have a measure of retirement that's separate from employment. Sure. Yes? Does that include, is that sleep time? This does not include sleep or work or personal care. Well, uh, yes. Yeah. So what about people that are institutionalized? And non, this is the non-institutionalized population. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so our focus is on this changing period, this period of change. So um, I'm going to go pretty quickly, but what I'm showing you here, I've just graphed co age coefficients for total time together in the blue, exclusive time in the yellow, and the reference is 50 to 54 year olds. Um, we're using the age of the wife here. So um, basically, as wives get older, 
um, couples are spending more time together at every age than they were when they were compared to 50 to 54 year olds. Yes. What's the scale? Uh, oh, this is ours. Sorry. So what you can see is 75 to 79 year olds are spending about an hour more together per day than 50 to 54 year olds. Um, and exclusive time, so that's time alone with a spouse. Uh, the difference is bigger, so people are um, basically more of their shared time is alone with a spouse and not with other people. Yes? Are you, I, I'm personally surprised that between 55 and 75, there's only about an hour increase, given that presumably many of the 55 to 59 year olds are working and a few of the 75 to 79 year olds are working. So I don't know if you're planning to, to talk about that. I'm a little curious about whether you were like, gee, that's not that much of a difference versus. Yeah, so this is age, age effects net of employment, okay. who else lives with you. And so here are the work um, relationships. So the key take home, and again, this is, this is predicted um, hours per day of time spent together. And the key take home here is that on the far left, if neither couple works, you spend a lot of time together. Um, about seven hours in total, and about six of those hours are just the two of you. Um, but if anyone's working, that total shared time and time alone together is quite a bit lower. So work really makes a big difference. Uh, so, so, okay, great. Work matters, you spend more time together. And the question then is like, so does it matter for individual well-being? Um, and so here we can leverage a nice module from the American Time Use Survey. Um, quickly, our sample is about 6,000 men and women, both members of the couple, 50 to 79. Um, respondents reported their well-being, experienced well-being during three randomly selected activities um, throughout the day. And we have about 17,000 activities that we're looking at. And so this is back to that, let me tell you about experienced well-being and, and why this, these data are interesting. So most research is looking at, um, you know, on a scale of one to seven, how, how do you describe your happiness in your relationship? And this is, you know, sort of the result of years together. Um, it might also be influenced by like whether you just had a fight or um, whether things are going really well or what you want your relationship to look like. What we have data on is experienced well-being. So this is, for those three randomly selected activities throughout the diary day, how were you feeling? And so the idea is that because these feelings are tied to specific activities, people can give, um, you can have varying reports. You can be happy sometimes throughout the day, you can be stressed at other points, and that's normal, right? We know that our, our feelings throughout the day are dynamic. So we're going to use these measures, and we're going to look at happiness and stress. So this is measured on a 0 to 6 scale, um, where a 0 means not happy at all, and a 6 is very happy. How did you feel during this time? And our focus is on um, activities done with a spouse versus not. So we can leverage these um, between individual, these individual reports and look at differences within individual. Um, so we're going to use multi-level models to account for clustering the, in the data. People have three observations, um, and they're not independent. And so based on work that we've done at, uh, for working age couples, we're expecting that individuals be, will be happier and less stressed when they're with their spouses, and um, that employed husbands will be happier and less stressed uh, when they're with their spouses compared to men who are not working. Um, so the idea, it's about the salience of paid work for men. So these, again, are predicted um, happiness and stress scores. I want to tell you, everyone's pretty happy um, in general in the data. Uh, but the differences are significant. So the gray bars are ta uh, happiness when people are not with a spouse, and the orange bars are happiness when they are with a spouse. So we're seeing a little bit of um, sort of enhanced well-being when people are with spouses and then lower stress for both men and women when they're with a, a spouse. Um, but as we expected, 
men's happiness together is tied to the couple level work status. And so um, for the both work couples and the only wife work couples, men are happier when they're with their wives. Um, so something about her not being there or them not being together, this is the absence makes the heart grow fonder idea. Um, so men get a little bit of boost in happiness there. Okay, I think I'm turning it over to Phyllis for another just, minute. Uh, uh, you can just stand here because I won't be long. Okay. I think of that like um, the sun in Southern California, uh, the warmth in Southern versus the warmth in Minnesota that you, when you're um, in Southern California and it's warm, you think, oh well, what else? But, but, but if you're um, only experiencing it once in a while, like if you're not always with your spouse, for men that seems to matter. Our main take home points is that couples share time increases with age, but work and family demands still limit the time they spend together. We looked at household composition. We're not talking about that, but we did find that. And individuals are happier and less stressed when they're with their spouses, especially for um, men and dual learner couples and those in which only the wife is employed. I don't really know how to use this, Sarah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you could do it. So, um, we examined uh, this relationship for older couples, and now uh, we're combining the assessments of marital quality with time diary based measures of shared time, both positive and active. And this is uh, using the PSID DUST study. And the DUST stands for Disability Use of Time. And uh, it, it, in it, it's a time diary study very similar to what the ATUS is with a couple important differences. One, they have both marital support and strain measures, and they have active versus passive time, which I talked about earlier, the idea that if you're together, doing something together versus just maybe being in the same house in the same place. And um, note that the amount of active time is very similar to total shared time in the ATUS for older adults. The third thing that's great about this study is that it has couple level data. So we're not just looking at individuals and their assessments of their, um, their life quality or their time use, but at, at uh, couples. Our expectations are that individuals in higher quality marriages spend more active time together and less passive time together. And uh, individuals in lower quality marriages spend less active time together and more passive time together. In other words, here you are, as you're moving out of paid work, you may be thrown together, but you can decide how you wanna, whether you wanna be together in, in that time. Okay, so the PSID data come from 2009 and 2013. Um, this is a supplement to the panel study of income dynamics. There's not much overlap between the 2009 and 2013 data. Um, respondents in these data were surveyed about both a weekend and a weekend, a week, weekend and a weekday. Um, so we have two diaries per person. Um, and the main respondent and their spouse, if they were married, completed diaries. So we can have up to four diaries per couple. Um, we've done some work, like Phyllis said, comparing results, and it's, it's a little scary how similar the data are, um, even though they were collected from uh, at different times by different people. So our sample here is married couples, and both members of the couple needed to um, tell us about their marital quality because that's one of our key uh, independent variables. But they did not have to both tell us about, um, or they did not both have to complete a time diary. Most people did. Um, our sample here is respondents and spouses ages 50 to 74. So we have about 1,400 individuals and um, 2,804 diaries. The couples in this sample, I just wanna give you a brief um, description of them. So they're about 64 years old on average. Um, they've been married for about 36 years on average. Uh, two thirds are still in their first marriage um, and about a third have second or third or on their second or third marriage. Um, they're also a very white sample. So 
Um, like in the, the previous results I showed you, we're going to show you um, shared time results as well as the relationship between marital quality and well-being. Okay, so our dependent variables for time with a spouse are active time. This is like the total time in the American Time Use Survey. Like Phyllis said, this is doing the same thing together, um, being in the same room. Passive time is they're at, at home together, but not in the kitchen together, for example. So our key independent variables are marital support and strain. Um, we're going to keep these measures of marital quality separate because they can, you can have both. Um, and we have nice alphas here. Um, I'm going to breeze through this quickly. So um, this is just a figure showing you uh, the relationship between marital support with low marital support all the way to the left and high marital support to the right. The top line is total time together. So this is active plus passive. Um, we like this because it shows that the averages are pretty consistent by marital support. Um, but what really differs is the way you spend your time. So active versus passive. So active is the red line and passive is the green line. So active time together increases with marital support like we expected. Passive time decreases with marital support. So um, the more supported you feel in your marriage, uh, the more time you're spending together um, and the less time you're spending sort of in the house together doing your own thing. Yes, Kathleen. Yeah. Good question. I will get there. Okay. Uh, this is the same figure by marital strain. Um, <laughs> sort of a less clear relationship, but as marital strain increases, active time um, is fairly level, and passive time mostly increases, except for at the end here. Yes? Do you have a strong theory about which one should be the independent? Yeah, so th that's a great question. So in this case, um, I think it would not be appropriate to have marital quality be the outcome because this is one day um, and maybe you were traveling last week. So you would spend no time with your spouse. Um, and the idea is that marital quality is a result of sort of accumulation of experience, right? Um, it's throughout the whole marriage and that might impact how you spend time on one day, but one day might not be reflective on, of an individual's or a couple's share time. At the population level, we think um, it is representative, but not for individuals. Yes? Is that active time exclusively a couple, or is it just that they're in the same room and there could be other people? There could be other people in this case, yes. All right, so, um, so what do we find? So this is basically, we're just, we're not doing anything with the couple level data here except for pooling it. Um, so we're not really leveraging it yet. And we find what we expect, marital support increases, um, active, share, active time together, um, high marital support is associated with less passive time. So things are moving as we expect, basically. This is where it gets interesting though. Um, it's with that couple level data. So what we know is that both his and her reports matter. Um, so if your spouse isn't happy, but you are, that might make a difference in how you spend your time. And so we're gonna use actor partner interdependence models to um, look at sort of crossover effects of husband's marital quality on wife's reports of shared time. Um, and I, I wanna, I'm gonna to try to give you a picture. So if we only had individuals, it would look like this. So we would have individual reports of marital quality influencing their reports of shared time with a spouse. And then if we also had the spouse's marital quality, that might also influence that individual's report. Th those are the results I just showed you. But what we have instead is we have both a his and hers model, and we can look at those crossover effects. So on the correlations, um, in terms of time use, couples tend to report, uh, there's a high correlation between 
his reports of active time and her reports of active time, about 70%. Um, some folks have looked at actual overlap in the diaries, and it's pretty good. They tend to report doing about the same thing, roughly the you know, generally the same thing, um, at about the same time during the day. Passive time has less of a correlation, um, and marital support and strain are even lower. So it's important to look at both individuals' reports. And just the non non-independence here suggests that we should use dyad models. All right, so these are the dyad models. Uh, let me talk you through it. This is the relationship between marital support and active time together. So for the husband models, we have the actor's marital quality, or sorry, marital support, having a non-significant relationship on his report of active time. For the husband models, the partner effect is significant. So if wives are happy, if their wives report high marital support, men report about um, a half hour more with their wives in active time. So for every one unit increase on marital support, it's a half hour increase. So for very happy couples, or for couples where the wives feel very supported, it's more than, it's like an hour and a half a day that they're spending more together in active time. So for the wife models, um, the actor is the wife, and if she reports high marital support, she reports about an hour more with her husband in active time. The partner effect, so the husband's marital support, doesn't matter for her report of active shared time. Does that make sense? Okay, it's a little confusing. Um, but the interesting thing is that it's her reports that are driving their active time together. Sarah? Yes. For clarification, just in terms of defining active time, is it that they're both actually doing the same thing or that they're in the same place? Or both of those things? So if she's chopping vegetables and he's reading the paper, is that, and they're, but they're both in the kitchen, yes. is that active time or passive time? So uh, it's gonna depend on how the individual reports it. And um, what we know is that uh, husbands tend to report being with their wives a little bit more than wives report being with their husbands. Um, and maybe it's that, right? She's chopping vegetables and he's reading the paper and she says, no, we're not together. Um, and he says, yeah, we're cooking dinner together. Um, <laughs> you know, so it's both. Thanks. Yes. All right, so marital support on passive time um, we see something a little bit different here. So for husbands who report um, high marital support, we see a negative relationship with passive time. So what that means is less passive time together. So high marital support, less passive time. No impact of the wife's marital support. For wives, um, we see that her feelings of marital support um, also decrease passive time with her husband. His reports don't matter. So it's, um, for passive time, it's the actor's marital support that's uh, really driving things. And in terms of marital strain, we see pretty limited evidence here, um, but, so the idea is that an increase in marital strain is associated with more passive time, so an increase in the husband's report of marital strain is increased in, is result, is related to an increase in his report of marital, of passive time, sorry. And um, for the wives, it's also the husband's feelings of marital strain that are leading to more passive time. And so, um, again, does this matter mm -hmm. for well-being, right? That's really the important thing here. And so, we have the actor's report um, of whether they're with a spouse, whether they're actively with a spouse in this case, and how that's tied to happiness. We have both the respondent and spouse reports of marital quality and how that's tied to their experienced happiness. Um, and then we're gonna look at the interaction of being with a spouse and marital quality. So what that means, what we're wondering is, <coughs> Does, um, is there a boost in well-being 
um, when you're with a spouse if your marital quality is better. Okay, so that's the interaction that we're looking at. So, uh, when they're with a spouse, that's just the one line, individuals are happier, net of everything else. Um, men and women who report higher marital support also report higher experienced happiness, regardless of whether they're with a spouse. Uh, if they have higher strain, they are less happy. Um, and the only interaction that we find that's significant is um, that women who report higher marital strain actually experience lower well-being when they're with their spouses than when they're not. Um, and, and so that's what we would expect, right? So if these relationships are not very healthy, um, well-being is lower during them. So th I think this is important. So we don't want to say that you know, just spending more time with a spouse is a good thing. It depends on um, whether it's a, you perceive it as a good relationship. Now it's Phyllis's turn again. So what did we get out of this? Is togetherness simply what older couples do in the absence of alternative obligations or um, is time together an, uh, uh, an indication of the quality of the relationship? What we find is that togetherness, both active and passive time in encore adulthood, is what couples do. Uh, they're more apt to be uh, together, but how they do it is influenced by marital quality. Higher marital support, more active shared time, and wives' assessments matter more. Higher marital strain, less active shared time, and husbands' assessments matter more. But I think a, an important contribution is this, this capturing the momentary feelings rather than just global awareness of uh, emotions <coughs> like happiness. It's highest when they are actively engaged with a spouse. Higher marital support leads to more <coughs> happiness and higher marital strain, less happiness. What we're uh, looking at is the importance of linked lives, the importance of looking at couple level data and also recognizing that every marriage is in fact two marriages, his and hers. And while they intersect and are highly correlated in some ways, they are less correlated in others. Uh, important insights about husbands versus wives assessments of marital quality matter for shared time and well-being. Uh, we also talk about adaptive strategies, suggests a cumulativeness to the relationship. So marital quality, as Sarah said, is not um, how I feel at this moment. It's an assessment of the overall relationship that has built up over the years. But also the adaptive strategies, and we don't get into this as much here, is related to work, especially for men, but also for women. They work additional work is sometimes um, needed for economic reasons, but more often it's a way of getting out of the house and, and having time separate from uh, being with one's spouse. Oops, sorry, I wasn't gonna go to that one. Should I go ahead and go? Okay, so <laughs> since I showed it, and this is this lockstep life course that we had on the, the left, and this bills on Matilda what Riley's uh, idea of we've got to have age integration. And uh, I really feel that, um, that just forcing two people to be looking at each other at home for the next 20 or 30 years is not a good idea for marital quality and how we can create uh, different kinds of activities across the life course, not just uh, uh, in uh, the active years of adulthood the prime, what's so-called prime years of adulthood. So, thank you very much. We'll take questions. So, so your last slide had these different domains that people are active in, and you've just looked at work so far. Do, do the data sets have other information about their volunteerism or activities? Yes. Yeah, so with the time diary we can look at whether people are volunteering or going to school um, on the day, whether they're providing care. We can also uh, 
leverage some other data, like linkages to CPS for the American Time Use Survey, to look at um, whether they volunteer over the last year, about how much per week. Um, we have good information on caregiving. Um, what else is here? Well, and we also uh, can look at leisure, whether it's active leisure or passive leisure, because a lot of leisure is watching television. And so we'd like to see maybe the quality of of uh, life goes up when you're when you're together, but doing something other than watching TV, or maybe it's TV that causes us to um, feel relaxed. Yes, Jalen. You mentioned that uh, you have uh, couples who've been together for different lengths of time, and I'm just wondering if you. Uh, looked at differences in their, you know, marital qualities, strain, time together, active, passively, et cetera. Yeah, so initially we did look at, um, you know, we graphed duration, yeah. average time together per day by marital duration, and it was pretty, um, I would say it wasn't very striking. Like, I didn't, I thought there would be differences, and there really weren't too many, um, but I think if we had digged a little deeper and looked by, this active or passive time, we might have seen something, but we just haven't gone in that direction. We should also look at, at remarriage and right. the timing of that remarriage. Yes? Does <coughs> income or wealth have any interaction with the uh, marital quality strain or active? Uh, I don't know. I'd have to go back to the data to look at that one. Yeah, I think that uh, marital quality is related to education in previous previous studies, but uh, we should look at that and look at how it affects momentary well-being for those at different levels of education. Good point. Right. You wrote it down? Yep. Good. Yes? Uh, so for the first study, the American Time News, you looked at years from 2003 to 2014, and I wonder if you notice any time differences, because a couple in 2003, like a 70 year old couple would be different than a 70 year old couple in 2014. Are um, you know, we've looked at that, and we haven't ever seen too much. Um, I think part of it is that change is slow. Um, but I'll go a different direction. One of the things that we have done with the American Time Use Survey um, is doing some work with synthetic cohorts. So trying to look at individuals who were 50 to 54 um, in 2003 and individuals who were 60 to 64 in 2013 to see if using synthetic cohorts, if we're seeing this increase in time that we see in the um, cross-sectional data, and we do. Um, so we're encouraged by that, but we haven't looked very closely at year differences because it generally doesn't do much. I think originally we did try to look and see uh, the recession years and didn't find that much difference. No. Nope. Yes, Ron. Do you have any data on siblings, especially um, retired siblings of either the husbands or wives? And does that may have any impact? You know, we don't. I th we've s I've seen some studies, but not enough of that. And I think that becomes more, those relationships become more salient in retirement than before often for people. So that's a, a great study. Unfortunately, most of our data are collected on individuals. And most of when it's when it's dyadic data, it's often simply the couple or the the um, respondent and the caregiver. But there's not a lot of work on siblings. I think that that would require new data collections. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Jonas. Yeah. So, uh, has there been any work done uh, on uh, a different operationalization of the of the use of time? Because here. The assumption is that the returns to another unit of time spent together is the same regardless of if it's between, you know, 60 and 61 minutes or if it's between 600 and 601 minutes. Um, and also, could you do something more in distinguishing between asset, active and passive time in terms of, I mean, the whole, you know, thinking in terms of quality versus quantity, you know, mm -hmm. very different activities may have different returns? Yeah, we can definitely do that. Um, in this case, because we were adding on the marital quality component, we decided to just look at active versus passive time. Um, but 
we could look at whether they're doing housework or watching TV or cooking together or going for a walk. We could definitely um, get down a lot lower in terms of what they're doing. Yeah, and we could definitely use the spline or categorical yeah. data, but I don't know quite where we would divide, what would be meaningful divisions. We could look at the data to see where that might be a difference. There might be sort of a tipping point if you're together yeah. X amount, yeah. and or if you're together even longer, it could be a negative effect. So that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Matt? I know some of the international kind of use surveys have whole house they survey whole households or multiple household members. I mean, do they have the other yes. elements that you would need to be able to try to replicate this uh, elsewhere? Um, so the PSID component with marital quality, that part? Or just anything about couples? Oh, yeah, or the well-being. Yeah, so um, the well-being data are pretty unique. Um, it's collected in a couple of countries, but it's definitely not um, standard. It's not even standard in the US. Um, yeah, we could definitely look at some data in different countries and um, look at, you know, sort of overlap in couples' shared time. Um, but next steps. But I'd like to ask you, do they actually interview all the members of the household or do they have one reporter about the time use? Mm -hmm. Well, Sarah would know better than I. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so they actually, in households where um, there are multiple respondents, that they each individual provides their own time diary. Good. Yes. Because I'm suspicious given the, you know, it's it's very hard to have one, re one reporter, as we've seen with the PSID on other things for all the years they did have that. Yes, Rochelle. So for the well-being portion, um, have you looked at when the event happens in the day. I can imagine, and I, this, I thought about this during the day when I saw another paper, that some portions of the day may be higher quality portions of the day. Maybe I feel more awake from 10 to noon than I do between 2 and 4. Mm -hmm. And whether or not they report better quality, you know, more satisfaction during those periods of time in general. And with this group, that's a good point, uh, because with this group, you know, they're having to reassess their their time use together. And so weekends that were normalized as being together. So it could be weekends versus weekdays where they're feeling better about being together. We need uh, experiential, uh, as people transition to retirement, Ron, we need, <laughs> we need the data of how that works and reassessing and reallocating time. Also, I, I think the whole concept of sundowning, you know, if, um, if you have people who are somewhat frail or cognitively challenged as they get older, um, they, they're just not holding it together as well as they get tired and it goes into night. Right. Th there was a question back here. Yes. Yeah, and I, I missed whether you controlled for this, but um, do you have any measures of caregiving or health in the um, PSID? And I imagine that might affect both marital I don't think we marital quality it, and time spent together. Um, and I was thinking that of that, especially when thinking about the um, estimates of increased passive time um, being positively associated with marital strain. Uh, so we have good measures of health in the PSID, actually. So we have a general health status measure, um, you know, from poor to excellent, how would you rate your health? And we also know whether um, either the respondent or the spouse have um, disabilities and the severity of those disabilities. We're controlling for both general health and disability in the models. Um, and I'm so glad I printed these uh, so I could refer to them. Um, and so basically we don't, we don't really see any health or disability impacts on shared time. But um, you know, Vicki Friedman at the University of Michigan, along with Debbie Carr, has done a lot of work on um, caregiving and how that influences well-being and how um, marital quality and caregiving and well-being are all tied together. It's def definitely a, an important um, thing to think about as couples are older, because a lot of the um, time together is about caring for someone, right? Um, helping them, or it might not just be watching TV or going for a walk. It could be burdensome 
right? It's a question back yeah, here. So like, I'm not sure if this question applies, but do you know if there's a relationship between like um, the between like the quality of marriage in term between like the quality of marriage among among like religious couples versus non-religious couples? Yeah, I don't think there's a measure of religiosity in either data set. Uh, definitely not in the American Time Use Survey. I'm not sure about the PSID, but um, that's a good question. Could you what, refer what? from reports of attending uh, attending church? church religious services? So um, maybe, but what if you didn't go to church yeah. that Sunday? Uh, we'd have to capture that, see them on a Sunday, and make some pretty strong assumptions that people go to church every week. Yeah. You know, if, yeah. that's a problem with time diary data is. Um, for f activities that people don't do frequently, uh, we, we see a lot of zeros. So maybe you work out Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but you were observed on a Tuesday, and your physical activity would be like zero. It doesn't mean you don't ever do any. So we, we have a hard time distinguishing between the people who do it but didn't do it on that day and the people who never do it. You had another? Well, like I was going to kind of add on to that. Like what if you decide to because what, what if you and your spouse decide to attend church together, but you decide that this marriage isn't for you and that, like, so, in other words, does the amount of time you spend in church with your spouse affect the past, like, the amount of passive or active time spent together? Yeah, and you bring up a, a point. If you decided this marriage isn't for you, uh, you're probably not in our data set. You're probably divorced. Um, in fact, if, uh, over 72% of men, 65 and older, are still are married, whereas only 45% of women. So we're getting a smaller and smaller group of women where this is a normative experience. Mm -hmm. So we need to also look at singles, mm -hmm. and I think they've been an understudied older older population. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, um, is there a reason that your data was restricted to heterosexual couples? And would you expect to see um, similar results if you uh, researched into homosexual couples? Um, glad you asked. So PSID is not going to have very many same-sex couples in these data because um, they're only for people 60 and older. Mm -hmm. Like that's, they're selecting on that population. Um, but in the American Time Use Survey, we can identify um, same-sex couples, and in some other work, uh, we've compared um, gay couples, lesbi lesbian couples, and different sex couples shared time, and um, lesbian women, lesbians spend a ton of time together, <laughs> like much more than different sex couples, um, and much more than gay couples who actually spend less time together than different sex couples, um, but I can get you information on that if you're interested. It's also hard to look at gender and gender relationships unless you're looking at heterosexual couples. But uh, an earlier study by a former student of mine looked at uh, uh, looked at uh, 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 same-sex couples and found that that even in same-sex couples, often one would take over the more household work and one would uh, take over more of the breadwinning. So I think we need to parse all of that out, uh, up, up the sort of gendered roles, absence, the effect of gender. Other questions or comments? Thank you, Phyllis and Sarah. Thank you. Thank you.